So we headed to Oxford, Mississippi, hung out with James Beard award-winning chef, John Currents. Cool. We got kind of under pressure in his kitchen. We got a pressure cooker. I thought the pressure cooker was, 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 pressure. was gone. And uh, we, we did absolutely one of the best pork roasts uh, I've ever eaten in my life. We hung out on the front porch with him. And I got to do some painting square books. A few years ago, it was voted as the number one independent bookseller in America. And Oxford, is that's, that's one of the things it's really known for. It's known for its writers. Yeah. And we just hung out on the square. We did Oxford. So you and I have spent a lot of time in Oxford with, oh, yeah. with books and on book tours and going to Square Books, but you've spent a whole lot of time in Oxford. I did a book on Oxford. I, yeah. loved, I, I learned a lot of how things work. When my friends went up as freshmen and I was a freshman at, at, a, mm -hmm. at another school in the vicinity, um, you know, uh, the, the Square was a little different place. And what it has become is, is much different than, than what it was. Very much, the Square, the square didn't really begin with the square. Some people tell me it's th there was the gin, there was the hoka, there was the warehouse, and those were off the square. But it gradually started seeping in, and next thing you knew, there were all these cool little shop mixers. The true game changer was Square Books. It's, it, to me, Square Books is like the epicenter. So Square Books opened on the square. It, it became one of the best independent bookstores in the country. Two doors down, City Grocery opened. You know, City Grocery, it's where you go to eat, hang out. Yeah. Once City Grocery opened on the square, it was a game changer. The thing about City Grocery, you know, John Currents uh, grew up in New Orleans. And so, you know, what's one of the top two or three food cities in America. Mm -hmm. So that's his background, that's his pedigree. And, and you grow up around that, and then he went off to college um, and worked under Bill Neal in the Carolinas. And, and Bill Neal was really the first person that started this new wave of Southern cooking. And, and then John, I think he came back to New Orleans, worked a little, and then went up to Oxford and opened up City Grocery. And it, it changed the game, really, in Mississippi. It was one of the first places of the new era. So John was uh, nice enough on a Sunday morning to you know go out and buy a pork roast, cook lunch for us. But as most Southerners are wont to do, we uh, just gotten some rocking chairs on the front porch and had a little bit of conversation. Southern culture on the porch. <laughs> so it's sitting here on your front porch in Oxford. It strikes me there are certain people and, and times that, that mark the era of this. Obviously William Faulkner, James Meredith. I think then you go into the Archie Manning area when you get era when you're 69. Willie Morris, Barry Hanna coming to town in 80 and Holworth is doing square books. And then I think it's you in 92. So kind of, I don't know if I want to accept responsibility for being <laughs> well, mentioned, you know. You just got it. You just got it. Whether, whether you accept it or not, I, I'm just telling you, that's the way I see Oxford. And, and I think the whole renaissance started uh, when you did City Grocery, you changed the culinary landscape. And I know there are other restaurants and there are other people, but it's got to start somewhere. In my opinion, it started with you. I, I just won't go away, you know? <laughs> I'm like a, just a really bad cold. And Oxford is still a college town. Even though Oxford is its own entity and there's this culture that, that is separate from the university. It, it seems like it's also got a lot of retired people who want to be in the presence of a university that has lectures and yes um, and and college towns uh, in in general uh, you know attract um, you know that that segment of the of the population and for those reasons because there's just there's so much to do this might be a good time bring Mamie back Mamie can you come come give daddy one more kiss we're gonna make you a TV star did you say of course you do such a good job yeah. of that I think you know, best kiss is like an award, isn't it now? Oh, that's good stuff right there. Cool house. Oh, yeah. John had a really cool house, cool wife, but I'm gonna tell you, one of the cutest little girls. Outside of our two daughters, uh -huh. I'd say John's daughters is, is, is right up there with the uh, win the cutest award. Good sugar. I've known John for close to 30 years now, and uh, it's been great watching his career just skyrocket, really. Um, from a guy who moved up and opened a small place on the square to 
to a guy that hangs out with Elvis Costello and, and travels uh, the world. I guess he's got five or six amazing. restaurants now. He's still, still opening them up, and Big Bad Breakfast is, is I think, in Birmingham and now on uh, Panhandle, and uh, it's just been, it's been great watching uh, his career take off, really has. I really haven't had any Big Bad Breakfast yet, you but I'm going to. I'm going you have to. not been to Big Bad I Breakfast. I don't know why. I haven't just thought of it right now, well, but I'm going to. we got to work on that. So you grew up eating New Orleans, North Carolina for college, uh, back to New Orleans and then to Oxford. So how does that all come together to define uh, John Currents' style of cuisine? I was cooking in the in the south of France. I was over there with my parents for my dad's 60th birthday, and um, was cooking with this French chef for about two weeks. The last day that we were there, the, uh, the the chef comes running up to me, and he has this pot of okra, you know, between his thumb and his forefinger. And he goes, "Tell me about this. I, I see all the time, but I do not know how to cook." And I was like, "Oh, that's okra, brother." And I, I was like. I'm, I'm fixing to put on a little cooking demonstration for you. And he comes back and he has this tiny little bag with like four okra pots in it. And I was like, no, man, it's not hot. Go get all of the okra. And that's what we, we ended up having, like a five course okra dinner that night. So I'm watching him taste through these things and I can see the wheels in his head turning like that he has this new weapon for his arsenal and how's he gonna fold it into his repertoire? You know, it's like, I could just see this going on. And it's in that moment that I realized, like, all of these things that I'm craving that I want to go home and cook immediately, that it's all coming out of my garden. Like, this is where my passion lies. And this is stuff that I just completely push to the side. But these are the things that, you know, that I love the most. And so, like, I could not get home quick enough from that trip. And that's really when our, uh, you know, food began to, to take shape. And you, you know, it was, I, I I realized that like the things that you know we did the best were the things that I thought about the least. Like when I just made a pot of seafood gumbo, like I just didn't think about it. Just Take sort it of for granted. Together, but I was thinking about doing something else that I was you know overthinking. But the gumbo would be spectacular. I know exactly what you're talking about. Right? Yep. You know the simplicity of how he prepares his food is really not that unlike the simplicity in painting. When you're young, you kind of want to do all these varied and sophisticated things, and then you get older and you grow in what you do. You figure out that the simple things are actually the most difficult and the best. They're the most challenging things to do. And he does that really well. I agree with that. And I, and I think the older you you become, you're, you're looking for things that are just real and true. And uh, those aren't always the shiny things. And our food began to, to sort of take shape as the food that sort of spoke to my life, and that was the, you know, the the French Creole of New Orleans, and uh, you know, and then this, you know, this very very sort of Sunday supper, uh, you know, food that you know that that I ate with, uh, you know, with my grandparents in the summers or when they came to town and my grandmother cooked, um, and so that's when you know I really realized that you know City Grocery was the food at City Grocery, you know, I was telling the, the story of my life through it. Big bag breakfast really uh, taking my favorite meal of the day, which is breakfast, kind of to another level, but it's everything we're familiar with. Big Bad Breakfast is, is really where, you know, we, we made a, a very, you know, hard right turn into um, e exploring that specifically. Uh, you know, it is, it's, it's looking at the, the very fundamental pieces of what it is, you know, that you're focusing on in the food and finding every way that you can to celebrate like that one central thing. And that's yeah. gotta be a lot like, uh, you know, your subject. It's one theme I seem to do in paintings, look for something that I have great familiarity with and try to discover something new in that. And that that's translates to me what, what, southern, what good Southern food, especially today, is. You, you got some traditional, but you try to do something to it that makes people recognize what it is instead of just go right past it because they've had it so many times. So I thought, visiting with John on the front porch, I thought we were gonna go right in to cook, but, but the light was right for you. And I know when the light is right, you gotta get there and get the painting done. And of course you chose Square Books. I think more than any other place you've painted, other than the Jackson Metro area, 
I, I would think Oxford is where you've done most oh, yeah. of your work outside of the metro area. Would yes. you agree with that? Of course, I do. I, I got to know it through other books I'd done before, but then I just kind of fell in love with painting that area and the dynamic of all the little shops and the history, the architecture, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. The food, the food. Yeah. How many times have you painted square books? Oh, golly. I, I'm sure it's been probably over 10. I bet it's been over 10. Different angles, inside, outside, rainy, sunny, night, day. Everything, you <laughs> this, know. This one was my favorite. Well, it was, it was you know, it was, it was the last one I did, and I'm, I'm always trying to get better with this, but it's, it's the center of all this stuff that we call Oxford. To me, it is. I mean, there are a lot of things people say about what makes a community what it is, but, you know, writing is certainly one of the things in Oxford. Mm. It's a big thing. The pressure's crazy. It's like working in a pressure cooker, man. It just keeps It going. is. The pressure cooking. Again, back to the theme of the day. Okay, I'm getting getting pretty pretty doggone close. Where I can say this is gonna be where we are. Painting on the square is really exciting. You meet a lot of people, a lot of people you might not meet anywhere else. I, I met Morgan Freeman there. I met Archie Manning there. I met uh, uh, Wilco there one time too. So I mean, you know, they're, they're all kind of um, opportunities, pedestrian opportunities. You don't get painting just any regular thing in Mississippi. You know, one of the cool things about uh, our professions, which are a little different but kind of the same, they is are. is the whole feedback uh, aspect of things. And, and it's a little with my cooking, but mostly with writing. You want you know, to know your audience. Is yeah, but you want to connect. People come up and they know about my family and they know stuff, details that I had forgotten. And I, and I know with art. That feedback component is, is you got the same. that expression, but you got you always want that communication. You want to get mm -hmm. across to them. Yeah. The other cool thing that uh, Square Books did is they started Thacker Mountain Radio. That is. Uh, great which tradition. you've been on Thacker Mountain. I've been okay. on Thacker Mountain. Um, I was on funny funny thing because you know the the town is so associated with Faulkner and Roanoke. I was on Thacker Mountain one time. Marty Stewart was a musical guest, <laughs> and we were sitting in the audience. I was reading uh, something from one of one of my books, and we were sitting before the show started. And he said, "He said, Did I ever tell you my Merle Haggard story?" And I said, "No." And he said, "I brought Merle up and showed him Oxford, and we drove around. I took him to Roanoke, and uh, we toured Roanoke, and I think we were on the square later that night. And, and he said, Merle looked over to me. He says, Marty. He said, I like this town, Oxford. He said, I said, you know what I really like? I like that old Billy Faulkner's house. You think he'd sell it to me? <laughs> <laughs> Billy Faulkner. The ghost of Faulkner is everywhere in Oxford. And you walk across the square, and you go in front of the uh, city hall, and there's the Bill Beckwith sculpture. It's a beautiful sculpture of Mr. Faulkner sitting there with his pipe, you know, and it's, On it's the a bench. pretty cool thing, yeah. yeah. It makes you feel the presence. If I'm not mistaken, I think the largest selling book in the history of Square Books is not a Grisham book, but Oxford Sketchbook by Wyatt Waters. Richard told me that one time, uh, Holworth, but it's, it's a great town and Oxford Sketchbook was completed about a third of the way through before it became Oxford Sketchbook. I was up there and I would just, like I do everything else, when I'm somewhere I go paint. That's just part of what I do. And I had gathered up enough of these things, and I thought, well, you know, I think I could do a book on um, Oxford. And so at that point, I began working on it. I met most of the people who, who added their writing to the book mm. by painting on the square, like I do everything else. I meet people on location. And so Archie Manning, Barry Hanna, all these people oh, yeah. submitted what Oxford meant to yeah. them in that book. It was a cool and idea. Met, the second book I did, Painting Home, uh, before it was about Barry Hanna. I, I met Barry. How did you meet Barry? Well, you know, I, I, I lived in Clinton and I lived about four houses down from his mother and father who were living at the time. And one day someone knocks on the door and, and, and he said, I hear there's a painter who lives here. <laughs> and of course, you know, we knew Barry Hanna. He went to Mississippi College where I went to school. And so when uh, he was leaving, he said, if you ever need a foreword or some writing or something like that, he knew I'd done some books. He said, give me a call. And so when I was doing uh, Painting Home, 
I just got on the phone and called and said, sure. And that's how we got the forward. You know, that's a very Mississippi story. You know, Square Books has been very good to us in mm. our career, and uh, I love the fact that well, if you're going to paint something, you know, paint what you know. And that's you know I'm Square the most Books. Experience. That's where I've got the most experience. So I, you know, I gave John carte blanche: do whatever you want. I didn't dictate. You cook what you want to do. Why now? Be there. You know, do what you want. And he said he'd been uh, kind of messing with pressure cookers lately. Not the new kind of pressure cooker, the kind like our grandmothers cooked with, the little valve and the whole thing, which are very dangerous. If you are gonna cook with a pressure cooker at home, read the directions. So <laughs> we gotta get that disclaimer out. But Don't he, try this at home. He, uh, he, he ran to the grocery store, grabbed a pork roast. There was about six ingredients in that thing. The pressuring process actually like forces flavor into whatever it is that you're cooking. So you get a much more intensely flavored red bean. When you, you know, the thing about pressure cookers is the pressure. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and it's, you're not cooking out all of the juices and the natural seasonings and all of the good vitamins and nutrients out of things, whether you're cooking red beans, yep. which taste red bean -ier. Yes or you're cooking pork roast or whatever you're doing. It just you know, makes it more of what it is. Like ever so really much is. more so. Homer's that right. pressure holds in the juices and that's what you want. When you lose juices, you lose flavor and it dries out and it's just not as good. And it's harder, I understand, to burn something with a cr pressure cooker. It, it keeps the moisture in it. It's, it's not that you can't burn, it's just hard to. Mm -hmm. Except beer dogs. Beer dogs, no. I'm gonna see. That's, that's what I'm gonna cook with my pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. I got one. There's a lot of apprehension around them because of, uh, you know, what, you know, what folks perceive as you basically putting a small bomb on your, right. you know, on your stovetop, and, you know, and the, and it really does make kind of a nasty racket when it when it gets going, and so it, you know, I think it may they, they make people kind of nervous, and that you know the odd thing that I explain to folks like when we're cooking in them is like, it's not the noise that should you should be frightened of, it's if it stops making noise. <laughs> That's where, that's where you, you've really got the problem. But he was right about that. It is a small bomb. You got to be careful with that thing. It's the bomb. <laughs> I came up here um, on a weekend because it's exactly as far away as I could get from New Orleans on a tank of gas and, uh, uh, and be back in time to work on Monday. I, you know, I just, this was just sort of a lark to come get away, relax, um, and my friend that I'd come to visit, he and I had worked at Coach Rose together. He was in the, the, the front of the house and, and I was in the kitchen. And, and we started talking, you know, just sort of about ideas that we'd had for things that we wanted to do in New Orleans and sort of dreaming about, you know, what if we went back and did this and that. And the smartest thing that he ever said to me was, well, why the hell do we want to go back to New Orleans when we could set up shop here? I mean, there's nothing going on here. Yeah, okay, sure, Oxford, Mississippi, that sounds great. It's, you know, it comes to, my, comes to mind for me right after New York and San Francisco when I, you know, I think about food. <laughs> and I went home, you know, back to New Orleans, and over the course of the next couple of weeks, that, that seed really germinated, and I came back up here sort of as quickly as I could. And uh, we, we started poking around. I mean, we, we bought some paint, bought our liquor license, um, and a liquor inventory and some beer and we opened the bar and just ran the bar for about two weeks until we could make enough money to buy a food inventory and buy some paint to paint the dining room. So we, we fixed the floor, bought a stove and opened the, uh, the downstairs. You know, that's the beautiful thing about the, the restaurant business. So, I mean, it's truly the American dream. I mean, people can start from scratch. The thing that I remember from that cooking segment is that once he opened the top safely, and you know, I took a bite, and then you took a bite. Came in like hyenas. I mean, it was, like, <laughs> it just couldn't stop, man. It was like, I'm gonna take it. I knew the camera was on, and I knew it was filming, but I was like, oh, this is so good. This is good. That's rare for men. I've eaten a lot of food in my life. I've eaten a lot of food. I can tell you absolutely the best pork roast I, I ever ate was in John, Cur John Currence's kitchen in Oxford, Mississippi. You don't really want your mom, Lucy, mm -hmm. to know how good that was, do you? It was really good. Cooked that way. 
It was so simple. The potato application he did, they were, they were sliced thin. It was a very uh, classic French treatment there. And, um, you know, it's good stuff. Whether it is a um, iconic or quintessential Mississippi dish or not, it is now because we're in Oxford, Mississippi. We had it. We created this great memory. I mean, you and me in Oxford, hanging out with John in his kitchen, eating that killer pork. We'll always have the pork. <laughs> we'll always have the pork. You know, years ago I did a, a poster. The first thing I did for University Press was a, a literary map, and it was a real big honor to do that. And so many of those writers were from Oxford, had some connection to Oxford. There's, um, of course, Faulkner is the main guy there, and, um, but Willie Morris, Willie Morris. Who wrote the foreword to one of your books? He did do that, and he, he gave me the manuscript to uh, get proofed by my dad, and my dad read it for accuracy and gave it back to me. He said, you may want to tell Mr. Morris to uh, include something about your mother's side of the family. <laughs> Those kind of little personal things. And Miss Wealthy, you know, Miss, all, these, all these writers from Mississippi, they all have to pay some homage to, to Oxford because it's such a center for writing. Mississippi's known for a lot of things. I mean, we're known for Miss America's athletes, but really, per capita, the, we have more writers of stature than just about any state. And that's a pretty cool thing. You know, Shelby Foote told, uh, told an interesting story about when he was young, I guess in late teens, and uh, drove over from the Delta uh, and went up to Roanoke and just knocked on uh, the door, knocked on Faulkner's <laughs> door, introduced himself, and and they kind of started talking about, you know, he, Shelby Foote was this, uh, you know, writer, uh, hopeful writer one day, and they actually went out and uh, as they were walking through the cemetery, he said, Mr. Faulkner kind of looked at him, he said, you know, Shelby, there's a, there's a story behind every one of these graves. Wow. Yeah. And Mississippi, just we're just people. That's yeah. the cool thing about yeah. Mississippi. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody has a story. My absolute favorite Faulkner story is, you know, he was a screenwriter in, mm -hmm. in L.A. and in Hollywood for a while and wrote a, a few screenplays. Uh, and he was at a, a big Hollywood function and Clark Gable came up and they were engaged in a conversation. and. Uh, they were talking about writers and Faulkner's uh, telling Clark Gable his favorite writers and reeling them off, included himself as, as one of the favorite writers. And uh, Clark Gable says, oh, Mr. Faulkner, do you write? Uh, to which he replied, yes, and uh, what do you do? <laughs> they were asking Mr. Faulkner, how can you drink so much and not eat? You know, how do you say, well, there's a lot of nourishment in an acre of corn. <laughs> corn it's true. Again. You know, it's something I talk about all the time, and, and you and I have talked about it a lot. I think the best art has a sense of place. Yeah. And yeah. and that that's Oxford to me. And it's, you know, it's, it is the square, but, but really when you think about it, it's a courthouse with a street that just drives around it. So, yeah. I mean, you know, instead of a courthouse with a street that drives in front of it. But it's more than that. It's, it's, it's what is made up around that that, yes. that becomes the square, and it's, it's it's people's love and appreciation for it. People that went to school there years ago, and it's their memories it's of the square and, and what happened there. And it's it's that sense of place. Whether you're talking about, you know, Monet's Garden, or you're talking about Gershwin's New York, or you're talking about Whitewater's Mississippi. Well, I, I love painting there because. In, in a lot of ways, it's Mississippi condensed into a walking area. I had my first, second, and third drink at the gin. Is that true? And maybe the fourth and fifth, too. I don't remember. <laughs> and then I went across to the Hoka back in the day. You know, it was that was where a lot of it began. Uh, but all the little shops there, I, uh, until it closed, I had every breakfast that I ever ate in Oxford at Smitty's. That was not because it was like, you know, a five-star or anything. It's just that you got all the regulars there, all the waitresses kind of having their little, you know, little arguments and the regulars sitting in the corner. And I would have uh, a you know, great cup of coffee and a beignet while I was there. You know, in a sense, that's Mississippi. Oh, yeah. It's small towns. It's the people. It's the little cafes. Mm -hmm. It's the bookstores. It's the courthouses. It's the place.
Stay tuned next week when we blow up someone else's house. That's right. The paintings seen on today's program are featured in the A Mississippi Palette Cookbook. This beautiful volume also includes Mississippi Heritage Recipes, A Mississippi Palette Cookbook. Palette to Palette with Robert St. John and Wyatt Waters is made possible by a generous contribution from the Mississippi Farm Bureau Federation. Additional funding is provided by this and other public television stations and from viewers like you. Thank you.